Hey everyone, I'm back. As you know, I'm Jen Eggert of Lackey Kids Ask an Autism Parent. And again, this month we are discussing knowing the sensory system. And this week we are getting into common issues with the sensory system. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. It is an off day for us. Normally we're on Thursday, but this week we are on Wednesday. For the whole month we will be on Wednesday. I am excited to welcome Gina to the show. I'm just waiting for her to come up on the screen. There she is. Hi, Gina. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for having me. Rose, welcome to today's show. Angela, I knew you'd be coming. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Like I said, I am so excited about learning more about the sensory system and this week getting into common issues with the sensory system. So, Jenna, let's start with why do people struggle with this topic so much? Why is the sensory system such a struggle, especially for our children? So everybody is unique, and that doesn't um, exclude our bodies and how they're made and how they interpret kind of our world. And so you see kids um, react differently to sounds and to things they see and to noises. Um, and you're seeing that as kind of a reaction to their sensory system. So a lot of their behaviors that they're um, showing or demonstrating is actually caused by that input from, from their surrounding the environment. Now, what are some of the signs? I know Everyone is unique and every child and body handles things differently. But what are the common um, signs that a person can be struggling that you look for? So there's two real big differences. There's the kids that are overstimulated and then there's kids that are understimulated and they look completely different. So these kids, you know, kids can be both at different times of the day and in different outings and experiences and situations. So you just have to kind of know what to look for. Um, when they're understimulated, this is usually missed by a lot of people because those kids are usually calm. Oh, I mean, understimulated, they're running around and they're trying to get um, attention. Sometimes people say they're attention seeking, but they're not. They're just trying to wake their bodies up. So and you, so you'll see kids that are running around or fidgeting or moving back and forth. Um, and I know you said that you had talked about the vestibular system last time. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that understimulation is kids that need more input um, in the vestibular way. Also the tactile way, the touching, the patting, the, that sort of stuff. And then the overstimulated kids are the ones that are seeking to like retreat out of the room or kind of go off in a quiet corner um, or they're melting down because they don't know what to do. We so, have one that actually leaves school and gets home, mm -hmm. takes off his socks and goes straight to the trampoline. And mom didn't realize until last month how important that was. Right. Right. It's so important because he's been working so hard at school all day long to try to pay attention and try to stay calm. And then you see that release when they come home. It's like all of this energy and they need to re regain that focus. And the way they do that is by taking movement breaks, basically. And so right. seeing a lot of those in movement with the trampoline. Um, I work with infants and toddlers, especially, so it's, it's totally different, but even just heavy work and carrying stuff back and forth, um, and just anything where you're, you're using your muscles is going to help those kids. I love Riley's teacher and I, I talk about it often, but she does this neat thing. The whole school does it, which I absolutely love. They do what's called brain breaks. Oh, fun. They use the big board. And the teacher plays music. Oh, yeah. They, they practice little songs and do the little dance. Like they did the kiki. They did the what yeah. does a fox say. And it right. gives them, when she notices them getting to the point where they need that, she'll stop class, 
and actually do a song or two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she finds that the focus comes right back. Right. It just kind of re-energizes you. And another thing that they're actually noticing that I'm recommending to all parents talk to your schools about, our kids are testing higher when they're given the brain breaks before a test. Yes. It's an amazing thing and people don't think about it, but Gina, you realize that it is huge. It is huge. Even just... It affects their attention span so much if they have that opportunity to take a break and to and to really increase their awareness in their entire body. And that's what is happening when they take those movement breaks. They're like those songs that they're hitting the drums or they're shaking instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, you're seeing that um, actively. Their active response is to actually concentrate and calm, calm down. So even for like little kids, if they, if you're trying to get them to do something or to sit at dinner, to eat or get in the car or something like that, then having them do one of those really active activities before those types of transitions, they will most likely cooperate with that a little bit better because their bodies are, are ready to engage. Right. I'm just going to jump to the comments for a minute. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, Many of you know I am on medical treatments for a rare disease. My hair was falling out, so I took it off at my own desire. So, yes, there's a big difference this week than there has been in the last few shows. Um, I know we have Stephanie watching. Stephanie's excited. She does a lot of... um, these sensory things through the school district she works for. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring up the fact that she has um, mentioned something called go noodle. You can go to Jason, just put on the screen. It's www.gonoodle.com. It is free to use. You can use it at home or at school. The teachers can use it at school. Again, Gina, you know, every resource available is wonderful to have. Yes. And you know what could work one day for your child? They may (laughs) not be interested in it the next day or even hour by hour. So, (laughs) which we all know, you know, and as they grow, something that worked for them when they were two is going to look different when they're five or six or seven. So having a whole bunch of different resources is very... And when they hit puberty, it's even better. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, folks. We hit puberty, and I'm not liking it. <laughs> um, Chris Mills says that she's a school bus driver. That she has kids who remove their socks and shoes on the bus. Mm-hmm. Again, it's that break. They need that. They've been cooped up all day, and they need that chance to just release. And for some, removing their footwear is. Riley does it. She'll walk in the door. Shoes come off. Socks come off. Right. Right. It's just, if you think about when you're in a room, and I don't know if we're going to talk about this later, but in a room and you, and you're, you're so intensely focused on something and all day you try to keep yourself together because you know the expectations of the situation. And it's really, really hard for you to do that. And so when you have any second where it's kind of those rules and that environment is let out you're going to just relax and part of that's what you're seeing on the bus is the kids are like okay i'm out of school now exactly this this is just my kind of way of now chris actually recently left school for an aba center and is thrilled because they gave lots more movement breaks through the ABA Mm -hmm. and you will find that traditional schools have to follow a set curriculum. They Mm -hmm. have to follow all these rules and guidelines and they don't always have time to throw those movement breaks in where ABA follows a more relaxed time frame Uh because they concentrate more on the task than the time. And they're more focused on the individual children versus the class as a whole. And I think that ABA or whatever kind of, if you have an IEP and they're giving extra support to the class, having that 
as part of their IEP is a really good idea. Just say, we want to make sure that these breaks are built into their day somehow. <clears throat> Either if they're overstimulated or understimulated, and so that they can come back and focus. And a lot of teachers are really good about identifying when that's happening um, and having an aid or having somebody support them. Right. And parents, I want you to know that you can do that. You can request, like Gina said, these movement breaks in the IEP. Mm hmm and like I always say, do not be afraid to ask for something in the IEP. Mm -hmm. If you really feel it'll help, the worst they can do is say no, but at least you can open up a conversation and maybe eventually they'll say that, see that you were right. Mm -hmm. And child, for an IEP goal, it's an attention goal. So you want to increase your child's attention span for X amount of minutes or whatever. And so... To do that, we need to give them breaks, and it could be more often in the beginning, and the goal would be to decrease the amount that you need, but at least having that in there as something that they're working towards. Now, I have um, Anna who has a question. Um, my child has autism and lately he spins a lot. Should I let him do it or try and stop him? And why does this happen? Um, that's an, that is him trying to regulate himself. Mm -hmm. That is a total normal, um, for an autism, that's a typical thing that you could see. Um, if he is, is he doing it at home or at school or do you know what? It, it does not specify. Anna, if you can specify if this is at home or at school. But my take on this has always been if they're not hurting anyone and they're mm -hmm. not disrupting major things, then I'm going to let it happen yeah. because she's doing it because she needs it. Right, right. And if it's something where if it's for some reason somewhere where she can't do it or she will be hurt, that's the kind of thing where you want to identify another outlet where she can get some of that sensory input. So if for some reason the spinning isn't isn't a good it's not a good time for that maybe jumping or maybe you know kind of squeezing a squishy ball or squeezing you know there's other ways that she can get input um mm -hmm. but it's got to be she's seeking that out so if it's spinning or something else somehow we need to give that to her and giving her options i don't know how old she is i don't think that would be she hasn't answered back, so she may be busy. Okay, but, you know, depending on her age and, and stuff like that, um, there's different techniques you can give her to redirect her if you if it needs to be redirected. Now, I just want to jump to the bottom to Jason's question. When will toddlers be on the topic again? Jason, um, every topic that I have lined up for the next while is good for all age groups. Gina actually... <laughs> is primarily working with early education, toddlers, preschoolers. And she, at the end, we will link you to a website where you can actually find activities that may help you with your son, um, knowing your situation a little bit. You may want to check out her website, which I will give at the end of the show, mm -hmm. where she'll talk more about different things. She has blogs on it but she is actually into early education and early intervention. Mm -hmm. So she would be great for you. What do we know? Um, what areas that he's asking about for toddlers? Is there sensory? Um, it's a little bit of everything. His son is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of everything. Now mm -hmm. I want to go back up to because that I, that's all I do is zero to five for my professional life. <laughs> right. And I, yeah. I want to say Jason's son is four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's four. Um, now I want to get to Cindy because this is a, a teacher's perspective. As a teacher who understands students who have sensory needs, it is frustrating when trying to help another student, maybe from another class who is struggling. Often the teacher punishes the behaviors instead of realizing that they need breaks. The mm -hmm. teacher is actually the one being stubborn in not educating themselves as opposed to the students. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to jump in here. This is 
where in kindergarten we struggled badly to the point where the teacher was bullying my daughter because she was not the round peg fitting into the round hole. So I actually had her moved from that teacher to a teacher who was a bit more experienced, not her in her first year, and who was good at dealing with children with different needs and who needed these breaks. She's actually who introduced me to brain breaks, as she calls them. So, yeah. Cindy, thank you for being a teacher who stands up for our children. Yeah, and as you know, I, I spent many years as a teacher. Um, the resources are minimal. So I think that that's also part of the problem um, when you see a lot of the teachers responding that certain way. So um, that's why I brought it back to the IEP or the IFSPs and trying to get some more support for your kids because it's Really, as a teacher, you can only do so much yep. with what you have been given. So I think that, yes, they need to be educated more, but also I think they need more support to allow them to do that. So. They do. Actually, um, for those that don't know, right now, Canada is trying to take away educational assistance. Really? And Yes. Um, my, I'm... My family is there, and my nieces and nephews haven't gone to school a full week in about a month because they're striking because these special ch needs children are not getting what they need. Hmm. As an aunt to a little boy who started school with a severe speech impediment and needed that extra help, it really bothers me. And, of course, if I had Riley in that environment, she would not thrive in the environment they're trying to create. Mm -hmm. They are going for the cookie cutter mold. Mm -hmm. You sit at your desk, you don't move, you don't talk, you get recessed twice a day and you get lunch. That's it. That's your only breaks. Yeah. And if you need help, you can't ask the teacher because she's too busy teaching. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask the EA and the EA can no longer help you because they're cutting them up. So we need to take in mind school and the way that they are set up because not all schools are the same. Yeah. Not all school districts are the same. Not all states either do it the same. So, and, you know, yeah. Alicia just commented, yes, my son has to be moved to a different school because they couldn't handle him. Yeah. And I know Angela, one of our friends, one of my friends on the show, she had to move to a lifestyle or a life skills school. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the school, but it's us as parents, I think. And I think you'll agree that we have to change our mindset and find the best educational plan for our child if it does involve changing. Yeah, and I mean, I, it, it's different state by state, but there's different, I feel like now, today, there seems to be more options as far as where to send kids to school than there used to be, the private mm -hmm. schools and charter schools and public schools. I mean, and the charter schools, I believe, at least here, they're within the district and they're, they're funded public, but they're, so I, they're I here. Think there's just, if you... But then again, you know, if you're in an area that's more rural, maybe you don't have all those options. Um, and you need to look more at, at what we can do to support the kids in the classroom. And that's where I think that giving the teacher more education. Around See, I had the choice this year of a charter school, of two charter schools that just opened. And everyone's like, your daughter's special needs, jump on this. And I looked at their curriculum. I looked at their, how they run the school and it was not appropriate for my child. She is thriving in public school. Not everyone does, but right. she was thriving. So I left her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every child's totally different. So you're going to see them thrive in different environments. Um, Jennifer, yes, you can do ABA with no school, but usually most states 
make you homeschool your child so they do get educational hours. So please check that out for your state as it does vary state to state. And some states you can go through your insurance as a supplement. Uh, yes. For education for ABA. If your insurance covers it. Now, I have more questions for Gina, but I just want to read um, Stephanie's thing because I know she's jumping off the feed in a minute. She has to go be mom. Mm -hmm. um, but because she works in the educational field, I want to read this. This is a common statement that we place in the IEP accommodations and modifications. Student name will be provided sensory tools and opportunities that provide deep pressure, proprioceptive input, as well as calming environments and strategies to, su to support his self-regulation needs. These items, breaks, and spaces will help with, self with self-regulation and attend attending issues. The occupational therapist will be able to help identify, consult, and monitor these items, spaces, and strategies with students' names, team, and staff. Guys, you must be an occupational therapist. Is <laughs> she an occupational therapist? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure you are an occupational yeah. therapist. <laughs> I can tell. Um, um, yeah. But folks, copy that down, please. Uh -huh. If you feel that would benefit your child, copy that statement down and bring it to your IEP. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid, like we were talking about, to say, we need this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop the questions for a minute and jump to. Um, I was before you jump. I was going to say, ask when you when you check out a school if they have an occupational therapist also, because I know that occupational therapists they're in large demand right now, and there's not enough of them. So not every school has one. So we I share one with enough with one other school. Yeah, there's just not enough therapists out there. There's not, unfortunately, um, our school board, they don't do private one-on-one -on -one therapy. It's group therapy sessions okay. because they just don't have the resources. Right. Um, now I want to get into, before we run out of time, can the body trigger issues with the sensory system? And what about the environment as a trigger? Right. And so our bodies respond to sounds and sight, so what we see and what we hear differently. And that's usually the sensory behaviors that you're seeing is your child responding to the environment. So, um, you know, what could be a, a dim light for us could be a really, really bright light for them. Or a, or a soft sound on the radio for us could be like a disco ball. For them. You know, I've, I've heard lots of different people explain how if your sensory system is really a sensitive then things that we can we can um ignore um other people cannot so even like the car driving by or the plane flying overhead or the sun going down or that sort of stuff can really trigger um, people that are sensitive and so I think that that's important when you're when you're looking at the behaviors that your kids are, are are showing you, track and see if some of those things are happening right before they re they you know have that reaction. Because one of the families I had couldn't figure out what was going on every Thursday, why their kids would freak out. And come to find out, the garbage truck started down the street, but they could hear it, and it was scary. And they responded um, and they couldn't say, you know, they were nonverbal at that time. They couldn't say it and they were just responding um, to sounds. And as adults, we ignore it. We're kind of used to that sound and, we, and they didn't acknowledge it until after a while they started tracking what was mm -hmm. happening at that time. And they realized, oh, that garbage truck is extremely loud to my child and I need to make sure that either we're out of the house at that time, or I have some other noise out in the house, or I have some other kind of coping strategy. But I think that that's really important when you're looking at, at behaviors in the environment. I, I agree. Um, Riley this year, 
on Tuesdays, they were the worst days. She'd always come home saying it was her worst day ever. And I started communicating with the teacher what changes on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. And nothing changed, but they have what they call specials. Yeah. PE, music, um, library, and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, art, they only go to once a week. Mm -hmm. Well, on Tuesdays, they had music. Ah. And when questioned, she did admit music was too loud. It was too much. So the principal quickly said, we're removing her tomorrow out of music because mm -hmm. it was a Monday. And she said, I'm not going to school tomorrow. So I called the principal and immediately, nope, we're removing her. What does she want? My daughter being my child picked library. <laughs> she loves her books. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a really good example too of you got to kind of go with what they need and don't be afraid. Now, I just want to say that um, Stephanie did admit, yes, she is an OT. <laughs> Sounded like an answer. Yes, she is actually one of our OTs that really helps with, she made a post in group today about our topic tonight. I'm like, that's what we're talking about tonight. Great. So she got excited. She wanted to come, but I know she had to leave now. Um, question about oral fixation. How can I help him? We do it in ABA class car or home. Um, Dana, can you please maybe give us a little bit more information on that? Because that was hard to answer. Gina, do you have an idea on that one? or Like eating a lot or um, sucking on things or what is he doing? I am scrolling to see if she posted anything else about it. Just give me a moment, folks. Putting fingers in the mouth. Yeah. So putting, so that's that, that's that thing where he is getting something from that. Usually it's sucking. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a, something you can replace that with either drinking, I don't know how old he is either, but drinking oh, like yeah. out of a straw, really sucking really hard, like thick things. I want to say between four and six. Okay, so like smoothies or those vibrating, um, you know, the vibrating like, teething rings. Vibrating teething rings. Uh, like, raspberries are called. Stick things that they fit in the back of their mouth. Um, giving something to replace that. We it's used to use good. silicone straws. Silicone straws. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. But even sucking a uh, really thick smoothies. Sometimes that helps because that uses your whole mouth. Your whole oral loader is incorporated in drinking and sucking out of smoothies. So if if that's and something that you can do to have that as um, an offer for him throughout the day, especially when he's getting ready to stick his fingers in his mouth, that might be a replacement. I agree. Um, Alicia, I ask that you please post your question in group. It's a little bit different than tonight's topic. How can we approach the potty training situation for older kids? So please post that in our parent support group and I will make sure that it is addressed in there. I have done videos on that before so we can link you to those. Um, let me go through. Angela says, we've had better luck over the years with younger teachers being more flexible in expectations of perceived behaviors. Yeah. I actually have had the opposite effect. <laughs> Brand new teachers for me have come in very rigid, where a more experienced yeah. teacher has been more, let's just go with the flow. They've seen it so many times that they've kind of learned to deal with it. Yeah. Um. Rose, I agree. Educational important are uh, educational assistants are so important that most of our children would be lost if they have one now and they took them away. Riley's kindergarten educational assistant spent was there for the entire class and probably spent about fifty percent of her day with Riley, mm. and it really shows we. Our friends, her daughter is in Riley's class again this year. So we were recently at her daughter's birthday 
and she said that she's so proud of how Riley has come so far. We have actually taken away the IEP because Riley has advanced to that point. And she said, I'm just so proud. I said, well, you were a huge part of that because she gave her skills. Um, Cindy, you're right. She's been teaching for 21 years and she's seen it all at different age levels and years of experience. It doesn't matter. Shannon, thank you for my hair. <laughs> um, yes, Chris is going to homeschool in kindergarten with ABA. That's what I thought she was doing. So now I want to jump to our last question, folks, and then I'll jump back to you guys. Why do our bodies respond differently to sensory stimuli? That is a good question. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to go back to saying that everybody is completely different. And so I think that something that could be, um, you know, something, a typical sound or a typical, a typical experience for one person is going to be different to somebody else. And I think that it just depends on, on your own unique interpretation of outside stimuli um, and how you have figured out how to cope, how to cope with that. And really it's learning about coping mechanisms. Um, right. Something that you don't have when you're young, and that's what you're talking about, ABA and stuff like that, and trying to teach your body different strategies to respond to different different sensory stimuli. And I exactly. think, yeah, I don't think that there's, I mean, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of science behind that. I'm not an occupational therapist, but I'm sure that everybody is completely made differently. And, you know, your nervous system is what, is responding to the sensory stimuli. And so even if you want to talk about tactile stuff, even with touch, um, some kids like to be squeezed. Some kids don't like to be touched at all. Some kids like to touch Play-Doh. Some kids don't. Some kids like sand. Some kids don't. I mean, it's so different. Um, that I think that our bodies just respond and cope to things completely different. And that's where you use some of those learned coping strategies to learn how to teach your body to respond right. to, those, to those things. In a different way. Now, um, let me jump back to the questions from the audience. Um Angela, I agree. We have had some amazing seasoned educators over the years who have gotten there through experience. We've also had some that were very unyielding. And, and I think that comes not only with education, that comes in every field that you come across. So nothing um, is like experience. Exactly. <laughs> Melinda says that my son is six and just started sucking his fingers again. Come to find out he lost his first tooth. So I think he may be sucking his fingers due to the feeling of the teeth coming loose. Or it could be, Melinda, it could be possibly trying to fill that gap. Which is, for us, we don't realize when we have a tooth missing, we don't sit there and go, my mouth feels weird, it's missing. He may, Gina, do you agree that he may be trying to replace that missing part of him in his opinion? Yeah, I mean, as a six-year-old, I'm sure he feels it. And it might not, it might be more so that he feels it with his tongue. And he feels, you know, when you move your tongue, your tongue's in your mouth all the time, and he's feeling that it's missing. Yeah. Um, so, or, um, yeah, he could be doing that. I, I think it's more so that he's feeling that it has changed, and he's trying to figure out why the feeling in his mouth is different, or why there's a hole there that wasn't there before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Angela found a new Chewy tonight made out of cloth wrapped around t-shirt materials. Her son does collar chewing. Okay. So I'm excited that you found that, Angela. I think that'll really help, help O in dealing with that. Now, Anna asks, I my kid, my kid is going crazy every time I try to help him brush his teeth, but he doesn't want to do it by himself. And he's six. Honestly, um, we've recently seen the dentist and they said a child should still be 
receiving help brushing their teeth till they're closer to eight to 10 hmm. because they can't get all of, they don't know to get all of the different parts of their teeth. We for a long time struggled. I let her pick her own toothbrush, toothpaste, anything to get her to brush. I found songs on YouTube about brushing teeth, everything. Finally, now the last, well, I went away in January and my mom was with the children and I came home and you call bedtime in 10 minutes and Riley runs to the kitchen, grabs her toothbrush and goes and brushes them. So I don't know how my mom did it, but I will ask her and find out because literally in two days, she had my child going from never brushing her teeth to being told 10 minutes before bed and her teeth are clean. And have you tried the uh, vibrating? They, they have the little kid vibrating toothbrushes and sometimes that will help. And they actually, the dentist told me that they're good for younger kids, especially because they don't know how much pressure to put and they clean more, especially those back teeth that don't get as much attention as mm -hmm. they, most kids will only go for this little part of their mouth. Mm -hmm. So Melinda, I was right. He tries to put goldfish in the space. So I think the finger sucking is trying to fill that space. So Melinda, anything to fill that space. I mean, silicone straws, anything to give him that oral um, stimulation again. Now, Angela, we are struggling with unintentional eye contact being hurtful. We don't even force eye contact. Is there anything we can do to help? So when you say unintentional eye contact, do you mean he's staring at people for a long period of time? Angela, if you could um, expand on that a little bit. I know that Angela's personal standpoint, Gina, to give you a little bit more information is they do not force eye contact. Mm -hmm. She does not believe in forced eye contact. Um, she is a mom with sensory issues herself. So mm -hmm. she is a little bit more in tune with how her child is struggling. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think what she's referring to is when people catch his eye, it is disturbing for him. And he looks away. And he finds it hurtful and looks away. I, I'm pretty sure that's what she's referring to. I know if I'm wrong, she will correct me. Okay. Um, but I, I think that's the issue. Is there anything that she can do to assist him with that? Well, it sounds like she's not wanting to encourage the eye contact. She um, encourages. She just does not force. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, with eye contact, it, it's, I feel like if a child is responding, but not making eye contact, but responding to a question or a prompt, that's similar for a child with, with autism. And, and an overstimulation with the visual component is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And if he's not wanting to look someone in the eye, that could be what's happening. Um, and, and, and that's exactly the situation is exactly yeah. like you just said. And so a lot of times, you know, I, like speech therapists like put things near their mouth. Like when they, when they say apple and they put the apple near their mouth or, you know, or they do doggy and they sign doggy, they kind of do it up near their face so the kids can imitate and see how their mouth is being formed. And that can help just over time make eye contact more playful. And just kids get kids used to looking up in that area. Now, she did elaborate mm -hmm. when they accidentally make eye contact, he becomes very distressed and cries. So, uh, so are you want to find ways to help calm him down when he gets me? Yes. That, well, um, I have lots of ideas for that. <laughs> How to calm down when we get overwhelmed. Um, um, Angela, I just want to warn you in two weeks, we're doing a whole show on, um, I will spill the beans a little bit. His name is soothing Sammy. He is Riley's current best friend. 
So we will get into that more in two weeks, Angela. Um, and you can post in group and I will hook you up with Gina and you guys can talk more because that is well, we can be very specific that. to mm -hmm. your son. And Angela is a lip reader. Okay. Okay. And what I, I want to make sure that you, um, I want to make sure that you respect him when he doesn't want to make eye contact. And oh, so she, she does. Are, and when he's upset and overwhelmed, just giving him things to help him calm down in a way that is simple for him is a great idea. So drinking a glass of water or crunchy snacks or, or something where you're able to redirect him if he has a lovey that he loves. Um, I think that that's really important. And I think that the more consistent you are with that, the easier it is going to be for him to calm down when he does get upset. If you have that same um, one or two um, interventions to give him every time, you're going to see him learn pretty quickly that he he is okay. And then he That's actually a really good idea for a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. Give those two, one or two reinforcements and then let them use them so then eventually they like riley now does it on her own mm -hmm. so folks i want to thank you all for joining us unfortunately we ran over which sometimes happens but i want to thank gina thank you for joining us um everyone i want to thank for joining us to subscribe for updates to join us for live to join us live, if you type five in our um, group chat now, we will subscribe you to live updates. And also, don't forget, we have a parent support group that we would love to have you join where we get more in-depth to these questions and answers and parents give their opinions. We have different professionals in there. Gina, I'm not sure if you're in there, but you're welcome to join. Um, so we really have that. We have a sensory deal group and Gina, do you want to talk about what you have? Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I have a, I have a website that has a variety of play-based educational activities that teaches to kids um, with a variety of different learning languages. So it's all play-based. So I have that on my website um, and a bunch of blogs uh, talking about a whole bunch of different topics. So you guys can head over there if you want to see any of now I'm going to ask Jason, there we go. Yeah. Jason just put it up on the screen folks so you can see her website. Um, to our father, Jason, that was watching earlier asking about the toddlers. Mm -hmm. This is a great website for you to get more information and really work more on the toddler side. She, she does all ages, but her specialty is toddler and preschool years. Mm -hmm. So thank you all um, for joining us. I will see you again. Remember this month we are off because of Gina's work schedule. We will be Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Um, Pacific time or 7 p.m. Eastern. So join us next Wednesday and we will get into more. Let me jump real quick to next Wednesday. We are talking about strategies for dealing with the sensory system. So join us next week for that. And remember, until next time, empower, support, and educate. Bye. Bye.